Well, good morning, everybody. So as usual, new homework for the week. Um, just five problems this time. It's a bit short, but we do have a midterm on Friday, so um, you know, not as much new material this week. Um, I am going to set aside some time Wednesday near the end of the class to talk a little bit more about the midterm. Um, but again, you're all aware what the format's going to be right. We've talked about it being closed book, closed notes, except that you can use the property table handout or your own version if you have one. Um, and also a three by five note card with equations and diagrams only, written on both sides of the three by five card if you choose to. Um, and again, it'll go from anything we covered from chapter nine, you know, right through section 10.3. Um, so what? Auto cycle, diesel cycle, Brayton cycle, and just the simple ranking cycle. So any of that's fair game on the midterm Friday. So let's just get back to where we were last time. Um, I know I said that I really didn't want to talk much more about the ranking cycle with closed feed water heaters, um, but I do want to just spend another few minutes um, talking about the closed feed water heaters. So you may recall that um, last time I had put a diagram here on the board. Um, I'm just going to redraw the same diagram. So if this is already in your notes from last time, it's not going to be necessary to redraw it. So this is the basic diagram that we looked at last time. Now, please keep in mind that you know, feed water heaters are used for regeneration purposes, right? In other words, to preheat the water that would be entering the boiler. Um, we know that a true regenerator is not really feasible, so we use feed water heating instead. Um, if we had an open feed water heater in place of this closed feed water heater, then this extraction steam, which is drawn off the turbine, it would simply mix together with the feed water entering from the pump. And that mixture would then just flow, um, well, it would be through another pump, but then into the boiler, right? With a closed feed water heater, we're still doing the same job, I and mean, we're still extracting steam from the turbine to preheat the incoming feed water. But this is now a real heat exchanger. This is a shell and tube heat exchanger. So there's no mixing taking place. Um, we have our feed water, which is heating up as it's exposed to the steam. The steam from the turbine is on the other side of the same tubes, um, but the steam then loses its heat as it collects down here in the bottom, which we call the drains. So it's a slightly different process. Of course, the drains eventually have to be reintroduced into the main line, and that's just done through this little mixing chamber. So what I really want to do at this point was just indicate the equations. And let me put the state points back here. Um, oops, there's another pump down here. OK. All right, so for us to be able to calculate the thermodynamic efficiency, um, as usual, we would have to find the ratio of the network over the heat input. And again, just like we saw for the open feed water heaters, we're really going to be taking the rate of work, in other words, the net power, divided by the rate of heat input. Um, we do understand, of course, that when we have extraction steam, we're, we're drawing off a fraction of the full flow. So we don't have the full flow going through the second part of the turbine, nor the condenser, nor even through the closed feed water heater, right? We only get the full flow again over here after the two streams are mixed together in the mixing chamber, okay? So since our um, units of mass are gonna vary throughout the cycle, we, we can't present the efficiency equation with work per unit mass or heat per unit mass because the, the units of mass are changing. So we're gonna do everything in terms of time rates, power and rate of heat input. Um, now, Ultimately, we would have an m dot term representing the full flow rate, an m dot extraction steam term, or m dot es term. Um, we're still going to use this extraction steam flow fraction, this term y, 
um, that we talked about last week. And ultimately, we're going to end up with this equation. Now, I'm not going to go through the derivation from that to the next, but um, it's all described in your textbook, and you can certainly read about it all here. Um, we will recognize, at least, that there is a flow fraction coming out from point 8, and that what remains at point 9 is just going to be 1 minus that fraction. Um, over here, this fraction y is going to go into the closed feed water heater. You have that same fraction y, which comes out the bottom. Um, and we have the same remainder flow, 1 minus y, that comes out here at point 3. So it really isn't, isn't until we get to point 6 that we have the full flow again. So we have the full flow from 6 through the boiler all the way up to point 8. And then we have this fractional flow as we go from 8, then all the way down to essentially point 0.3 again. So we have to keep these flow fractions in mind. Now, we would note that I'm going to divide out the mass flow rate, so uh, I'm not going to put all the m dot terms here. Um, we will be left with just enthalpy terms. Uh, we know that we have the full flow going through the first stage of the turbine from 7 to 8. So there's definitely an, an H7 minus H8 term. Um, but then we do more work as we continue through the turbine. and we only have that fractional flow that remains, 1 minus y, as we go from 8 to 9. So h8 minus h9 has to be here. And then we subtract from that any pump work terms. So we have the big feed water pump from 1 to 2, although it doesn't move the full flow. It's just got the fraction 1 minus y. So we'll have to have a 1 minus y. And then, um, well, we go from point 0.1 to point 0.2, so an h2 minus h1. And then we also have this drain pump, which is going to use that small pump that's just going to move the fraction y. So that fraction y is between 0.4 and 5 on that pump. So h5 minus h4. Okay. And then this has to be divided by the heat input. And just like we saw previously for the open feed water heater, uh, there's only one heat input. And that comes in the boiler, which is between 6 and 7. So we just have an h7 minus h6. Now, the problem with applying this thermodynamic efficiency equation is that it's really not sufficient. Um, if we had a open feed water heater, we know that we're going to have to do another energy balance, or if you will, a first law analysis, on the open feed water heater itself. In this particular problem, we actually have to use two more energy balances, or if you will, two more first law analyses. Um, one would be the first law on the closed feed water heater itself. So uh, again, I'm not going to write this in terms of mass flow rates. Let's just think about it in terms of the fractions. Um, we have two flow paths coming in. We have the 1 minus y fraction coming in at point 2. So we have a 1 minus y h2 term. That's the feed water. And then we have the extraction steam coming in with its fraction y, so y h8. Um, and then we have two streams coming out. We have the remainder flow 1 minus y coming out the heated up feed water at point 3. So this has to equal 1 minus y h3. And then we have the drains coming out the bottom. So that's the fraction y, and its enthalpy is at point 4. So this would be one of the equations that we'll need. And you can see that it is indeed in terms of the flow fraction y, which is what we're interested in. Um, but let's also note that there's really going to be additional unknowns here. Um, after we mix everything together in the mixing chamber, um, we don't exactly know what the thermodynamic state is at point 6. Um, we're going to have to also do a first law analysis on that mixing chamber. And then that's going to give us an additional equation that we could then use to solve for our y term, any of our unknown enthalpy terms, and ultimately find the efficiency. So within the mixing chamber, well, again, we have the fractional flow coming in at point 3, so 1 minus y h3. Um, we also have that drain pump coming in from point 5. So that's the fraction y then times h5. And then we have the full flow, the combined flow leaving, so no fraction anymore. And the full flow comes out at point 6, so this then equals h6. So this then gives you the set of equations that one is going to have to utilize if you have a closed feed water heater.
So I think last time I left you with just a statement that um, even though this is better in industry to have um, closed feed water heaters rather than open feed water heaters, um, with closed feed water heaters, the analysis is a little more complicated, right? We've got an additional first law analysis, um, so the analysis becomes just a little more complicated. Um, nonetheless, closed feed water heaters are still preferred. Um, please note that we have a small second drain pump. Now that's going to be much, much cheaper than if we had an open feed water heater with then a full-size feed water pump um, that's going to then pump the water into the boiler. So, um, yeah, we're going to use this kind of system. It's actually going to be a little cheaper for us in the long run and will still give us the improvements in efficiency that we want via regeneration or again through open feed water heating or closed feed water heating. Um, so we do definitely find these a lot out there in the real world. Um, I also believe last time I had mentioned that you're always going to have one open feed water heater in a real steam power plant. Um, much of it is just for deaeration purposes, but then you're going to have multiple closed feed water heaters, not just a single one like is shown here. You can easily have a dozen closed feed water heaters, each one drawing steam at a, a different extraction steam pressure, um, each one having its own heat exchanger, each one having its own drain pump. Um, so, yeah, it gets rather complicated in the real world, but that's why we have computers, right? Let them do all the hard work for you. So, any questions? All right. So, now I'm actually finished with this discussion of the ranking cycle and its variations. Um, we have a little bit more understanding of closed feed water heaters. And now we're going to move on to Chapter 11. And this is really the last of the thermodynamic cycles we're going to deal with. This deals now with refrigeration cycles. So we're done with the heat engine cycles, auto cycle, diesel cycle, Brayton cycle, ranking cycle. They're all heat engines, right? We know that we're trying to maximize some network output and minimize the heat input that we have to pay for, right? In a refrigeration cycle, everything is now reversed. Um, what is of interest to us is the amount of heat transfer that we're able to attain from such a cycle. Um, we certainly want to maximize that rate of heat transfer, right? Trying to maximize the cooling effect in an air conditioning system or in a refrigerator or a freezer, something like that. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, we're trying to minimize what we have to pay for, which is our work. So we're trying to maximize heat transfer, minimize work, and thus we're going to have to put together a performance parameter that is as high as possible. Of course, the heat transfer is of interest, so we want it as high as possible. It has to be in the numerator, not work like thermal efficiency. And of course, we want the um, work term to be as low as possible. That's going to be in the denominator. So with refrigeration cycles, um, let's just say that this black box represents the cycle. There's something going on in here. Um, we know there's going to be a certain amount of heat input. We know there's going to be a certain amount of heat rejection or heat output. Um, but we also know from the second law of thermodynamics that you can't simply transfer heat from a low, temperature sink, uh, a low temperature heat source to a higher temperature heat sink, right? You can only do this if we provide some energy input, and this is done through work input. So this is just the very basic refrigeration cycle. Um, please keep in mind that when we analyze a refrigeration cycle back in your first course in thermo, we were really only interested in the magnitude of these various terms, and we were interested in figuring out the magnitude of that performance parameter, right? We call it the coefficient of performance. Um, now that's not our interest anymore. Just like with the various cycles, the heat engine cycles we've looked at, um, now we're actually looking at what's inside the box, right? What are the different devices that are within this cycle that allow us to, well, provide for some sort of cooling effect? So. Before we do that, though, let's just keep in mind that the coefficient of performance, COP, is our performance parameter of interest. We want to maximize this. Um, we know that this is defined as the desired heat transfer divided by the required work input. Okay, so this is the basic definition of coefficient of performance. And here now, we also have to remember that there's two basic types of refrigeration cycles depending upon what our desired heat transfer is. Uh, the one that we generally think of 
is that which applies to the refrigerator or freezer or air conditioner or ice maker or anything of these devices or any other type of device where what is of interest to us is maximizing the heat that we can pull out of what we're trying to keep cold. In other words, Q in is the desired heat transfer. Okay. So for this particular type of device, we'll use a subscript R, nominally R for refrigerator, and the desired heat transfer is just going to be, well, again, the heat input. And then the required work, we'll just show this as the work input, and that would be the equation that we're going to ultimately have to calculate, right? This is what we're interested in. Furthermore, we may have that other broad category of refrigeration cycle where we're not interested in how much heat we can pull out of something that we're trying to keep cold, but rather how much heat are we going to reject into a space that we're trying to keep warm. Um, there's no reason that you have to use a refrigeration cycle to refrigerate or cool down an airstream or a water stream or a food stream or whatever it happens to be. Uh, we may also run a refrigeration cycle where what we're interested in is that heat rejection. And this particular type of device is what we call a heat pump. So please don't confuse heat pump with the generic heat engine, okay? Um, this is not heat engine. This is a type of refrigeration cycle called the heat pump. And here, it's the heat output that's desired. Now, we don't see a lot of heat pumps here in Southern California because, frankly, there's natural gas lines buried pretty much under every neighborhood, and it's cheaper for us just to buy natural gas and burn it in our furnaces, and in that way, we're able to get some heat output to, say, keep our house warm or heat up the water that we're using in our hot water heaters, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But there are certainly many areas of this country and, indeed, the world where they don't have natural gas lines everywhere. Um, maybe they don't have the ability to bring big propane tanks in for various reasons, transportation reasons, road condition reasons. But they have electricity. Essentially, everybody has electricity. So why don't we just use a refrigeration cycle and just have the ductwork set up in such a way so that essentially we're refrigerating the cold outside air. Um, remember, we're doing this in the wintertime. We're trying to keep our house warm. Let's just further refrigerate the cold outside air, pulling heat out of it, and then dumping that heat into the space that we're trying to keep warm, um, into our room, if you will. So that's what a heat pump is all about. And again, they're very common. Um, often, um, let's say in oh, apartment buildings, um, you know, it's cheaper to have a single unit that acts both as a heat pump and an air conditioner than it is to have a separate air conditioner and a separate gas heating system. So often apartments will indeed just have a heat pump. And the heat exchangers used in the heat pump um, are basically interchangeable. Um, you can use one heat exchanger. What we'll learn that the two heat exchangers are called condensers and evaporators. Um, we could just switch them, simply change the direction of flow, change where the heat transfer takes place and use the evaporator as a condenser and the condenser as an evaporator. And one air conditioning unit will exactly double as a heat pump, as, as a heat supply. So let's talk a little bit about the heat pump. Well, first of all, it's the same device, right? In the same basic cycle. However, the heat transfer of interest is different. So the only thing, honestly, the only thing that changes in this type of analysis is the way we describe our coefficient of performance. So first of all, we put HP for heat pump. <clears throat> and then our desired heat transfer is not the amount of heat we're pulling out of our cold space and putting into the cycle, but it's the amount of heat we can eject from the cycle out into the space we need to keep warm. So Q out, and then divided by the work input. And that's the equation we would then use if we happen to have a heat pump. Okay. Um, it should also be noted that both of these equations can be modified. I mean, we've seen similar modifications with heat engines. In other words, we would note that for a cycle, um, the, the net work is going to have to equal the change in the heat. So we could just substitute a, you know, for the work term, either here or here, just the difference between Q in and Q out, and go through manipulation, and we would end up with the following equations. So for the refrigerator, freezer, or air conditioner, it's just going to be 1 over Q out over Q in minus 1. 
over here for the heat pump, um, again, it's going to be slightly different, but similar. It's going to be 1 over 1 minus Q in over Q out. Okay, so this was all derived for you in your ME301 thermal class. So I'm not going to go through the derivation, but at least we understand that these are the equations that we're going to have to utilize. Now, a couple of other things just to note before I start applying the first law. Um, as you're reading through this material on cycles, certainly you're seeing the author talk about the Carnot cycle over and over again. Um, we understand that we can calculate coefficients of performance for a Carnot cycle that operates between the temperature limits of this problem. We also understood that when we talked about heat engine cycles, any of them, we could have also calculated the Carnot cycles um, thermal efficiency. Um, just keep in mind that we, we can't build Carnot cycles. Carnot cycles simply represent a theoretical limit. You know, nothing can have a higher thermal efficiency in a heat engine than a Carnot cycle operating between two temperature limits. Nothing can have a greater coefficient of performance than a refrigeration cycle. That is a Carnot refrigeration cycle operating between two temperature limits. Um, but quite frankly, since we can't really build them, I, I just don't even see a real point in spending a lot of time on it. We, we just recognize that the Carnot cycle is a theoretical limit. It's certainly something worth comparing to our actual coefficients of performance, or indeed thermal efficiencies for other cycles, but it's not something that's really that critical for us in this class, so I'm not even going to really talk about the Carnot cycle. It was discussed in your first course in thermo. It's certainly discussed for each of these cycles um, in your textbook, but it's not something that we really can spend any time on, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that often when you read about cooling associated with these refrigeration cycles, um, you're, you're being given a tonnage of cooling. You know, how many tons of cooling do we need? And most people don't really even know what that means. Um, quite frankly, a ton is not really an important parameter. It was just really one of the first parameters. Um, you know, if you go way back to what, the 19th century, when they had the very, very first of these old style refrigeration cycles, um, they defined the word ton to mean um, the amount of heat transfer needed in order to turn one ton of liquid water into ice at zero degrees Celsius. I mean, that's what a ton of refrigeration was. Um, of course, back then, all you were doing was making big blocks of ice. It, it made sense, right? And then these ice blocks were carried around by various people with big ice picks to the ice boxes of the day, right? Well before refrigeration, you know, they used ice box as refrigeration. But nonetheless, you'll read about this whole concept of tons of cooling effect. Uh, basically, a ton is like 12,000 BTUs per hour, um, but still, at least you understand where it comes from. So, again, those are just side comments. Let's get back to our cycle here. And um, again, with the understanding that our analysis doesn't really care whether we're talking about a refrigerator, freezer, air conditioner, <laughs> or whether we're talking about a heat pump, um, let's now look at the equipment within the cycle. Now, there's actually two different refrigeration cycles, one that we will have the ability to analyze in this class and the other that we're just going to talk about. Um, we need to understand them, but we just don't have the ability in this class to do any analysis. So this first type of refrigeration cycle, we'll just call a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Um, the other type of refrigeration cycle is called an absorption refrigeration cycle, and we'll talk about that later. All right, so what is a vapor compression refrigeration cycle? Let me just draw the cycle. So we're going to have two heat exchangers, um, one that is going to reject heat out into a high temperature sink. And the other is going to take heat in, um, and this is going to come from a low temperature heat source. So, okay. so if this were an air conditioning system, um, 
In the middle of the summertime, your low temperature heat source is the room you're trying to keep cold. And the high temperature sink is the ambient air outside your house. Okay. So we've got these two heat exchangers. Now what happens? So we actually have a two-phase mix which is going to enter the lower of these heat exchangers. And as heat is being added, what do you suppose happens to the two-phase mix? Well, it's going to vaporize. And eventually, you're going to hit the saturated, uh, saturated vapor conditions. So when you get exactly to a saturated vapor, that's when you're going to leave this device. Now, this device is causing the evaporation of a substance. So we call it an evaporator. Okay, so the evaporator is the low end heat exchanger. That is the one that operates at the low temperature. Now, once we leave as a saturated vapor, we're now going to go through a compressor. And I guess I made my compressor look like a pump. Now, let's make it look like a compressor. So we go through a compressor. And then, of course, if you have a saturated vapor and you're compressing it, then you have to end up in the superheat region. So here's my work input in the compressor. And we leave superheated. All right, so if we think about it, the temperature of whatever substance is inside this cycle has to be at a lower temperature than the room you're trying to keep cold, or the food you're trying to keep cold in the refrigerator, or whatever, right? I mean, heat only transfers in a heat exchanger from hot to cold. So your low temperature heat source actually has to be hotter than the fluid moving through the evaporator. Um, that way you transfer heat. Okay? Um, something similar happens at the, eye, at the high end, right? We need to compress this vapor until we get to a temperature that's actually higher than the temperature of the surrounding environment, right? If your outside environment's at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, you've got to compress this up until you get to maybe 130 degrees Fahrenheit so that you have enough temperature difference to transfer the heat out of the fluid in the cycle and into, well, the outside air. So we come out superheated, but now we transfer heat out of that superheat and we're basically turning superheated steam first into saturated steam. I'm sorry, I'm using the word steam. We don't know what the substance is and I, I shouldn't use the word steam. Um, we can just call it the refrigerant. Some refrigerant is moving through the cycle. Anyway, we have superheated refrigerant. Um, as we pull heat out of a superheated vapor, it's going to condense, right? So we call this device a condenser. And we design this such that at the exact point where we've condensed all the vapor into a liquid, that is when we finally get to the saturated liquid conditions, that's when we draw the refrigerant out of the condenser. So over here is going to be a saturated liquid. And then as we move from saturated liquid um, down to the two-phase region in the evaporator, um, we have to do this through a device that's called a throttle. Um, let's keep in mind, although we haven't talked about this yet, that the condenser is operating at a much higher pressure than is the evaporator. Right? So when we compress the refrigerant from saturated to superheated vapor, um, we're achieving a very high temperature as well as pressure. Um, we've got to drop the pressure of this saturated liquid back down to the pressure of the evaporator. And you want to do that without losing the potential for doing work or for transferring heat. Um, in other words, as we go through this process, we'd like to be able to maintain the enthalpy as a constant value. We certainly don't want the enthalpy to drop. As the enthalpy drops, that's lowering our ability to transfer heat or do work, right? So how do you do that? Well, a throttle. If you recall back to, what, chapter five, when you were dealing with the different steady flow devices, one of them was called the throttle, okay? And what you should have been specifically aware of is that in a throttle, there's no change in enthalpy. So that's exactly the device we want. Um, you can think of a throttle as just kind of a really tiny converging, diverging nozzle. Um, you just have a, a flow obstruction, if you will, and that drops the pressure down. And because of the smooth nature of the inside walls of the throttle, you're not going to have any significant losses. These are also very well insulated. So you just have no enthalpy loss at all. So right in here, then, is our throttle. And often we just show it as a circle with a big X in it. 
Now, if you are in the air conditioning refrigeration business, they don't call this a throttle, they call it an expansion valve. Um, but it's exactly the same thing. What a refrigeration tech would call an expansion valve is what we know in thermodynamics as simply being a throttle, or you can even call it a throttle valve. Um, but this is the throttle that's right here, and it's used just to drop the pressure without losing enthalpy. So this then represents the cycle that we're going to deal with. Um, let's just say that state point one is the sat vapor leaving the evaporator. State point two is the superheat leaving the compressor. Three is the saturated liquid leaving the condenser. And then four is going to be the thermodynamic state leaving the throttle and then going back into the evaporator. So even before I draw the TS diagram, some things to note. Just like we saw for the various heat engine cycles, heat transfer is going to actually take place at constant pressure. And this is going to apply to the evaporator and the condenser. They're both heat transfer devices. Heat transfer occurs at constant pressure. And let's also note that in the ideal case, um, the compression is done isentropically by the compressor. So isentropic compressor. Now, eventually, we will talk about the non-ideal case. Okay? And if we talk about the non-ideal case, then the compressor is not isentropic anymore. We basically need to use the compressor's isentropic efficiency. Okay. And then let's lastly note that the enthalpy is constant in the throttle. Okay. So what would all this look like now if we wanted to put it on an appropriate thermodynamic property diagram. So let's just do this on our usual TS diagram. Um, we know there's going to be phase change associated with this process, a couple of them. So we definitely want to show our dome, our saturation curve, if you will. Um, we know that state point one is a saturated vapor leaving the evaporator. Um, let's just look at the ideal case for now. Um, in fact, let's show the two constant pressure lines associated with this problem. So there's going to be some minimum pressure that the evaporator operates at and a maximum pressure that the condenser operates at. So we leave the evaporator as a saturated vapor at one, and this is always going to be saturated vapor. Um, in the ideal case, it's isentropic. So 0.2 is directly above 0.1. Um, so this is where we have our work input. Um, then we have our heat rejection. So here's going to be heat out as we go from two to three. Okay. And then as we go through the throttle, um, the throttle is not an ideal process. And as such, the entropy is going to increase. And as the pressure drops and entropy increases, we're definitely going to move towards the right. So here we have state point four, and you can see pretty clearly that it is indeed a two-phase mixture at this point. And then lastly, we go back into the evaporator, and this is where we reject our heat. Now, just for observation, let's make sure that we recognize a couple of the comments that I made before on this diagram. First of all, the temperature of the refrigerant that moves through the condenser has to be at a higher temperature than the ambient air. Uh, is there a question? Oh, that can't be. Yep, Q in down here in the bottom. Thank you. Yeah, heat in at low temperature, heat out at high temperature. Yeah, thank you. So anyway, we remember that in the condenser, in order for heat transfer to be possible, we have to make sure that our refrigerant is actually at a higher temperature than our high temperature heat sink. So if you just wanted to make a note of that, 
So this temperature, which is lower than T3, this has to be the temperature of the heat sink. Right? It has to be less than T3. If it's not less than T3, T3 being the temperature within the condenser, then you can't have heat transfer in the right direction. And then let's also note that the heat input in the evaporator, well again, if we want to have heat input, then the temperature of our heat source, like the inside of your cold room or the food in your refrigerator, that has to be higher than the temperature of the evaporator. So it's going to be up here somewhere. So this temperature right here is the temperature of the heat source. So let's say we're talking about a home air conditioning system. Maybe you want to set the air conditioner to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. That's fine. Um, that's going to be the temperature here of your heat source. Um, you need to make sure that the temperature of the refrigerant is less than that, right? So this has to be then greater than T4, your evaporator temperature. So if you're trying to keep the room at maybe 78 degrees Fahrenheit, then probably your refrigerant is going to be closer to 45 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit down here on the low end of the cycle. And then up here on the high end of the cycle, if we're dumping heat into a maybe 110 degree Fahrenheit outside airstream, then of course we're going to have to make sure that for the heat transfer to move in the right direction, our refrigerant has to be quite a bit hotter than, than that 110 degrees. It's probably going to be 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, you, you know this from your own experience on home air conditioners. Um, anybody who's ever gone outside and looked at the, the big device with a big giant fan on it and all that, it kind of looks like a weird looking radiator. That's not a weird looking radiator. Um, what you're actually looking at is the condenser. Okay? A condenser has the appearance of a radiator. Um, the condenser has a vapor going into it and a liquid coming out, but it's transferring heat into the air. So it's got a large surface area and you know, something that looks like a radiator has a large surface area. Um, so I'm guessing most of you have already seen condensers before. You've probably seen evaporators before. In fact, as we're talking about this now, let's look at a typical house just so we have a better understanding for where all this really sits in the house or outside of the house. So, Again, this is just an example. This is a home air conditioner unit. Okay, so here's my house. Um, I'm not going to bother with the doors and windows. And somewhere in the house is a device that removes the heat from the house. In other words, your evaporator, right? Now, where does that evaporator actually reside? Um, most of you will hunt around your house and you know, you'll open the closet where the furnace is and You'll say, oh, that's the furnace, that can't be the evaporator. But it actually is. Um, the furnace usually sits on the ground, the evaporator sits on top of it, and then there's one big fan that blows air across both. Um, if you have the heater on, then the evaporator just sits there and does nothing. It's not even working. If you have the air conditioner on, then the furnace just sits there and does nothing. But in both cases, air is blowing through. So we have a, a supply air duct. Um, usually this is kind of the big one that sits near the floor and it's right underneath where your furnace is or your evaporator is. Um, so that's just a big air inlet. And then there's going to be a fan. Okay. And this fan is going to actually blow the room air across the heat exchanger. That is, blow it right across the evaporator. So we have some duct work now. In fact, the whole thing really has duct work. And here is going to be the evaporator. Okay. So the evaporator, remember, is cold, right? It's colder than the air that you're trying to keep cold. So the air that comes out of the evaporator is going to be even colder. Um, if any of you have ever just kind of put your hand in front of one of the heating registers or AC registers in your house, um, even though you have your air conditioner set at 78 degrees, that, that air is cold, right? It feels like around 50 degrees. 
Well, it is around 50 degrees. You're going to blow out 50 degree air into the home. It's going to mix with the cold air that's already in the house and eventually cool down to whatever your set point is. But nonetheless, coming out the top here is going to be the cool air. And this is going to go to the, to the registers, the, the vents, if you will. Um, you know, like these things that we see up here in the ceiling. So cool air to the vents. Frankly, we don't care about any of that. I mean, we do. You'll take, um, what, ME418, you'll learn about air conditioning, and you'll certainly have to now start dealing with the air that's moving through the system. But in this class, primarily, we'll just talk about the refrigeration cycle. So we're really not even there yet. Although I will note that we will talk about air conditioning in this class. So even before you get to your 418 air conditioning class, if you indeed take it, um, in this class, you'll have a couple of weeks worth of air conditioning discussion. So yeah, think about the air. but future problem. For now, let's go back to our cycle. So we know that this device here is the evaporator. Uh, we know that we come into the evaporator as a two-phase mixture at point 0.4, and we leave as a saturated vapor at point 0.1. Now, all the other equipment is actually outside the house. Okay, This evaporator right here is the only thing that's actually inside the house. Okay, Well, the tubing or piping is inside the house, but usually it's up in the attic. You don't even see it. All right, so now back to the cycle itself. So we have 0.4. We come into this heat exchanger called an evaporator, and it picks up heat, and it turns it into a vapor. Now we go outside, and you know this is where you're going to see that, that big thing. Um, so often, it kind of looks like this. There's a fan on top. Um, you all recognize that. I mean, I don't do good drawings, but you know, if you got one, it'll look like that. Sometimes they're rectangular rather than circular. Okay, and then below it, or, or often it's actually inside, you don't even really see it, um, but I'll just show it below. Um, this is where you're going to have your actual compressor. So this is basically just all one big unit that sits outside. Here's your compressor. And this big thing that, again, kind of looks like a car radiator, that's the condenser. Okay. Now, why do you suppose there's a fan on top of the condenser? Well, you're rejecting heat out into the environment. You need a fan to blow atmospheric air across the little tubes in the condenser um, so that you can affect heat transfer. So back to here. So we're at point one. We leave. Um, and we go into our compressor. So go here. So here is the compressor. I'll put C. And we come out of the compressor at state point two. Okay. Now we go directly into the condenser. So right here, right into the condenser. Um, we have the compressor, which is pushing the refrigerant through the little tubes. We've got the fan blowing air across the outside of the same tubes. Actually, the air comes in radially and then just blows straight out the top. Nonetheless, we go into our condenser. We transfer heat. And we leave at point 3. And then also somewhere buried within the mechanics here, is going to be the throttle valve. They're small. They're only that big. Um, so it's also going to be outside somewhere. And we drop the pressure and flow right back over towards the evaporator. So this is what's really happening in your home air conditioning system. Now, if you are interested in, I don't know, how about a refrigerator or a freezer, it doesn't look a whole lot different. It's just a lot smaller, and it's in a confined space. Uh, your refrigerator. All you really see is where the food goes. Behind the refrigerator is all the mechanics, right? Behind the refrigerator, is, there's got to be an evaporator. There's going to be a fan. There's going to be a condenser. There's going to be a compressor. There's going to be all the tubing. Um, so all this will certainly exist. It's just not quite so visible. About the only thing that you really feel in order to know that this cycle exists is if you get up in the middle of the night and you're standing in front of the refrigerator and you feel that warm air blowing on your toes, it's like, well, it's a refrigerator. Shouldn't I be feeling cold air on my toes? No, you're not inside the refrigerator. 
you're outside the refrigerator, the cold air, I'm sorry, the warm air on your toes is, is this, right? It's the warm air coming out of the condenser, this being blown out into your high temperature heat sink. In other words, the room of your kitchen, right? The refrigeration cycle is buried inside the refrigerator. So this is often hard for students to kind of understand that there's multiple streams going on here, right? We've got air streams outside, we've got air stream inside, each with their own fans, which have absolutely nothing to do with the refrigeration cycle. And then of course you have the works, if you will, of the refrigeration cycle. It can get pretty complicated, um, but that's okay. You're upper division ME students at Cal Poly, you can handle it. I handle it, you can handle it. Of course, it was 40 years ago for me. Um, anyway, questions on this? So now that we hopefully have a better understanding of the basic processes, now let's talk about refrigerants. It would sure be nice if we had some substance that exists in nature that had the ability to change phase at the relatively modest temperatures associated with the typical refrigeration cycle. And these are modest temperatures, right? Whether it's a refrigerator, freezer, air conditioner, or even a heat pump, um, the temperatures are relatively low, right? The, the low end temperature is gonna be somewhere, um, you know, probably right around the freezing point of water. Let's call it 35, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The high-end temperature is going to be maybe 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, are there any substances that exist in nature that would allow me to transfer heat at those temperatures, or at least within that temperature range? Well, the answer is maybe. Kind of depends on how you look at it. Uh, many students will say, well, what about water? I mean, water exists everywhere. Why don't we just use water? Well, at atmospheric pressure, water doesn't boil at 85 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 120, it, it boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So the only way we're going to get water to work is if we run the entire refrigeration loop at a pretty significant vacuum, you know, a pressure well below atmospheric pressure. I mean, we know that the saturation temperature corresponds to the pressure. If we can drop the pressure below standard atmosphere, then we will also drop the temperature at which that heat transfer takes place, right? The saturation temperature. But do we really want to have a separate vacuum pump system just to continually maintain the low pressure within the refrigeration loop? No, it's going to be rather expensive. Um, and we probably don't really want to do that. Um, maybe there's others. Um, how about something like ammonia? Well, ammonia actually does work. Ammonia will vaporize at the relatively modest temperatures of this type of cycle. Uh, the problem is that ammonia is toxic, it's flammable, it's explosive, and it's not like you can't use the stuff. It's just that it has those real world problems associated with it. Um, do you really want to have an explosive mixture of ammonia moving around between the inside and the outside of your house on a daily basis just waiting for a spark? No, I don't think so. Um, what about propane? Um, propane will work too. It turns out propane exists. Um, it's just refined from crude oil. Um, propane will change phase at the relatively modest temperatures that we need, but again, it's explosive and, and flammable, so we don't really want to use it. Well, fortunately, there is such a thing that's called a chemical engineer. Um, you've heard about them, they're in that other department, right? Um, chemical engineers do this kind of stuff for a living. They invent materials, they invent fluids, and the fluids that they invent are called refrigerants. Um, sometimes we use the word freon, um, but freon is actually not supposed to be used as a generic term. I don't know, it's either Dow or DuPont. Of course, I think that's the same company now. I think they're the ones that own the rights to the word freon. Uh, but nonetheless, call it freon if you want. Uh, there's different types of freon. Um, everybody used to use Freon-12 until we found that the chlorofluorocarbons were actually destroying the ozone layer. So that's banned now throughout the entire world. And fortunately, the ozone layer hole that was being created when I was a young man has now been sealing up. So it turns out that worked. Um, there's new refrigerants that are environmentally friendly, like R134A, which is actually the only refrigerant that you have data for in your tables. Um, but nonetheless, these refrigerants are manufactured substances. They're designed specifically to change phase in the range of temperatures, but at not particularly high pressures. Um, keep in mind, too, that if the pressure is high, then you need very, very thick-walled tubes and pipes, so they become expensive. 
Um, if the pressure is too low, then you need that vacuum pumping system. So you really want something at a modest pressure above atmospheric, and that's really where the refrigerants come in. So can we use ammonia? Um, yeah, but it's not real good. Um, can we use propane? Well, by the way, when I say not real good, it's fine as a refrigerant. It's just kind of toxic. Um, propane's explosive, so they don't really work. Um, but basically, we have manufactured refrigerant. And quite frankly, since refrigerant 134A is the only refrigerant that we have thermodynamic property data for in our textbook, that's the only refrigerant that we're going to use for any problems that we're going to solve. Solve. Okay. Um, I guess I should also add water to the list. Um, but again, that only operates at low pressures, and the vacuum pumping system is a problem. So it's really these, the manufactured refrigerants, that we're going to be dealing with. OK. So again, now we have more of an understanding of the nature of these types of systems. And now let's go back to our performance parameters and look at the coefficient of performance. OK, so first of all, I have the first law that I'm trying to analyze. Um, these are steady flow systems, right? So it's first law for steady flow. Um, like all the other systems we've dealt with, we're neglecting any changes in kinetic or potential energy. Again, the velocities are kept low on purpose. The height change is minimal for these types of systems. Um, and also keep in mind that the work device, which is our compressor, is isentropic, adiabatic reversible. In other words, there's no heat transfer. And let's also keep in mind that for the heat transfer devices, the condenser and the evaporator, they're passive devices, right? There's no moving parts. So they just exchange heat, so there's no work terms. So whether we're talking about the condenser, evaporator, or compressor, you end up with enthalpy change, right? The heat transfer in the condenser and evaporator is equal to the enthalpy change across that device, and the work associated with the compressor is just the enthalpy change across that device. So if we look at the coefficient of performance for the refrigerator, well, refrigerator, freezer, air conditioner, then again, the numerator is the heat input term, and the heat input is between 4 and 1. So this is just going to be H1 minus H4. That's the heat input term. And then the work input is between 1 and 2. So just H2 minus H1. And there's your equation. Um, what about if we happen to have a heat pump? Now, first of all, I didn't discuss the heat pump in nearly the detail that I did just the air conditioning system, but consider this as a heat pump and consider that all you're really doing is changing out the direction of some of the piping. Um, you will operate the evaporator as a condenser. You'll operate the condenser as a, an evaporator and you'll just reverse the flow direction. So coming out of the compressor you'll go into the condenser, which is going to be inside the house, and that's where you're going to reject heat out into the house. You come back, um, and you'll then uh, go through, um, well, you'll go through the throttle, and then you go into the evaporator. And um, you know the evaporator is when you're going to pick up the heat outside from your cold outside air and uh, transfer that heat into the refrigerant so that you can then dump it into the house. So it really doesn't change anything at all. I mean, all it changes is the direction of flow, and then these numbers, of course, are all going to be reversed as well. So don't think of the heat pump as being difficult or complicated. It's just something we're not exposed to here. Um, but now that we are exposed to them, we see, oh, they're just air conditioners. They use exactly the same data. The analysis is the same. Just slightly different need, right? Heat in instead of heat out. All right, so here's our heat pump. Um, heat out is from 0.2 to 0.3. So this is just H2 minus H3 in the numerator. And then the work input is, again, from 1 to 2. So H2 minus H1. Um, again, all the other terms go away. And we're just left with these nice, relatively simple equations for coefficient of performance. And frankly, now we're at the point where we can look at an example problem. Um, we have everything we need, believe it or not. So any questions on this? 
Okay. Well, that should come on shortly. Um, by the way, hopefully you can see me better today. I, I did send in a request for maintenance, and it looks like they replaced all these bulbs up in the front. In fact, the whole room is now lit well, so hopefully it'll be better for the camera in the back. All right, so it looks like we're coming on now. All right. Now, this is problem 1114, but it's actually from the seventh edition of your textbook. Um, I think I would mentioned that some of my examples are going to be from older editions of the book. So here's the problem we're going to look at. Um, so we have a refrigerator. Um, we know that it uses a refrigerant 134A as a working fluid. Um, and it's an ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. And it gives me the minimum to maximum pressures associated with the cycle. Um, we also have the mass flow rate that's given as 0.05 kilograms per second. Let's show this on a TS diagram and then find all the usual. We want the rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space. So please keep in mind that you may not know immediately whether that means heat out or heat in, but we know that the refrigerated space is what we're taking heat out of and putting it into the refrigerant. So even though it says remove from the refrigerated space, it's actually the heat input term that we're being asked to find. Um, we want the power input to the compressor. So of course, that's just mass flow rate times work per unit mass. And we want the rate of heat rejection into the environment. And then lastly, we want the coefficient of performance. So let me just redraw the TS diagram relative to our constant pressure lines. So one, two, three, and four. Okay. And then as far as what we know here, again, we know that it's R134A. Um, we have the max and minimum pressures. So P2 and P3 are the maximum pressures. So that's 0 0.7. And P1 and P4 are the minimum pressures. So that's 0.12 both in megapascal. Um, mass flow rate is given. 05 kilograms per second. So we've already shown it on the TS diagram. The rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space is actually Q dot in. Um, the power input, W dot in. Uh, the rate of heat rejection and coefficient of performance. So Q dot out. And since this is a refrigerator, then it's COPR that we're looking for. Okay. Now, certainly we understand that the rates of heat transfer or the rates of work are just mass flow rate times heat or work per unit mass. And of course, the heat of work per unit mass terms are the ones that are shown within the coefficient of performance equations. So Q in is just m dot times lowercase q in. And the heat input comes between points 1 and 4. So this is m dot times h1 minus h4. The work input is just m dot times h2 minus h1. Right, h2 minus h1 is the work per unit mass input. The heat output is the heat rejected as we move through the condenser from 2 to 3, so m dot h2 minus h3. And then lastly, the coefficient of performance for refrigerator. Um, well, since we already have calculated the rates of heat transfer and work term, let's just also show this as a, a rate equation. Now, I suppose I could just use the equations that are already over there um, rather than show it as Q dot over W dot. In fact, let's just do it that way. That'll probably be easier just to stick with the equations. So this is going to be H1 minus H4. So this represents the heat input to the cycle. And then the denominator is the work, H2 minus H1. And these are now the equations. Now M dot's been given. And everything else we should be able to find pretty easily. Um, first of all, state point one is a saturated vapor, always. So we know P1. So at P1, um, we go into the appropriate refrigerant table. Now keep in mind the refrigerant tables 
are A11, 12, and 13. A11 is the temperature saturation table, A12 is the pressure saturation table, and A13 is superheat. So we'll actually go into the pressure table, A12, um, um, at this particular temperature, H1 is Hg. So we just have to look that up at this particular pressure. Um, we would also note that it's an isentropic process from one to two. So let's also look up the entropy and then note that at S2, which equals S1, and at P2, um, we can then look up the enthalpy at point two. And this is always gonna be superheated. I mean, if we start with saturated vapor, we, we definitely have to have superheat. So this is table A13 where we're gonna get that data. So that allows me to find H2. Um, H3 is also a really easy one. Um, H3 is always going to be a saturated liquid. So at P3, um, we'll just note that H3 is equal to HF. So we'll be able to look that up. And again, this is in the pressure table, A12. Um, again, it's a saturated liquid. In fact, even over here, I probably should have said that at P1, sat vapor, that's how we get the conditions of point one. Nonetheless, um, we, we just look up the enthalpy of the saturated liquid at that pressure, and we have HF, which is H3, and then we simply note that H4 equals H3. It's a throttle, so they have to be the same enthalpy. So there's not really a whole lot to do here. Um, look up a few numbers, and calculate a few results. So let us do that. All right, so just back to over here. Um, at P1, saturated vapor, Hg is 236.97 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, and we'll look up S1, and that's 0.94779 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Um, and then at S1 equals S2, um, you are gonna have to do some interpolation. I mean, you're gonna go into the P2, which is the what, 0.7 megapascal subtable. Um, you'll read down the entropy column until you get S2, which equals S1. And unfortunately, you're gonna be in between two entries. So you do have to interpolate, but we get 273.50 kilojoules per kilogram for the enthalpy at point two. Um, at that same pressure, P2 and P3 are the same. We can look up HF. So this is just 88.82 kilojoules per kilogram, which again equals H4. So, so now it's just a matter of plugging everything in to the equations. So I'll just say plug in above and that arrow should go all the way up to those top equations. We'll find that the rate of heat input, which is again the rate of removing heat from the food in the refrigerator, um, this gives me 7.41 kilojoules per second. Uh, the rate of work input, W dot, is 1.83. And it will be in kilojoules per second, but it's the same as kilowatts. So we have the power if we look at the rate of heat rejection from the cycle, so out into the kitchen, and this is 9.23 kilojoules per second. And then last but not least, the coefficient of performance, just using the various enthalpy data that we already have, or we could just do the ratio of 7.41 divided by 1.83. I mean, either way you do it is fine. But nonetheless, for this refrigeration cycle, we get 4.06. And there's an example of this, the ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle with R134A as the refrigerant. So any questions on this one? All right, pretty straightforward, right? So we'll talk more about this on Wednesday. Um, again, you've got an exam coming up Friday, so I will, I will spend some time Wednesday talking more about that. So that's all for today. Please don't forget to pick up homework if you didn't do so last week. Um, I do have a couple more there. Otherwise, I will see you next time.